In this presentation, we will take a look at inherent risk and control risk with relation to the audit of inventory, the inventory management process. Recalling our procedures here, when we think about the auditing of inventory, we're going to take a look at inventory. We're going to assess the inherent risk. First, a word from our sponsor. Well, actually, these are just items that we picked from the YouTube shopping affiliate program, but that's actually good for you because these aren't things that were just given to us from some large corporation which we don't even use in exchange for us selling them to you. These are things that we actually researched, purchased, and used ourselves. Here we have a Western Digital WD Elements 20 terabyte USB 3.0 desktop external hard drive we use as part of our backup system, noting that if you lower the number of terabytes of storage, the price will lower dramatically as well. When you're thinking about a backup system, you're usually thinking about an online system or an external hard drive system like this, or ideally some combination between the two, giving you some redundancy. You can also work directly from an external hard drive like this, but there are some drawbacks to doing that. One being, if you use this as your primary drive you're working from, it's no longer a backup drive, and you're gonna need a backup system, possibly another external hard drive and or some kind of cloud backup system. And if you're working on something that takes up a lot of short-term memory, a lot of RAM as you're working on it, such as video editing, the external hard drive can slow up the system. So you might wanna come up with some kind of system where you download the project you're working on to your computer, to your C drive, or possibly to a solid state drive, which is a much more expensive uh, external hard drive as you do the work. Once the work is done, then save the project to an external hard drive such as this. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com where we have many different courses. You can purchase one at a time or have a subscription model giving you access to all the courses. Courses which are well organized have other resources like Excel files and PDF files to download and no commercials. We're going to assess the uh, control risk, and then we're going to use those for the detection risk process. That's going to be related to us. So remember that the inherent risk, control risk, in essence, you can think of those basically outside of the auditor's control. Those are things that are kind of managed or decided on, on in some way or the other by the company. And then we are going to take those risks and determine the uh, detection risk, which is what we do have control over through the amount of testing that we will do so we have to consider these two risk factors inherent risk control risk and then consider them with relation to detection risk so first we will consider inherent risk now inherent risk you'll recall is going to be the risk that it's just inherent within the process so if we were to basically remove the controls altogether then you would think that's the inherent risk that's just inherently risky now note the business doesn't have a lot of control over the inherent risk other than the fact that they chose to be in that business and chose to take on whatever inherent risks are in relation to it. Then they look at those inherent risks. They put in place the internal controls related to them that are supposed to mitigate those inherent risks for things that should mitigate the risk of material misstatement as well. The thing we're concerned with as our job for the auditor. So we're going to be wanting to depend on the internal controls as well. So we need to have an understanding of these things. So we have the inherent risk items. The auditor will need to think about industry-related factors and operating engagement characteristics while analyzing the possibility of material misstatement with regards to inventory. And of course, that's going to be our main goal here. We're thinking about material misstatement with regards to inventory in the financial statement in this section. When there is, when there is a lot of industry competition, so if we happen to be in an industry that has a lot of competition, there are often problems with the correct valuation of inventory. So there's more inherent risk. So if we happen to be in an industry where there's a lot of competition, how do we know what the value of the inventory is? It's tough to say because it's volatile given the nature of the industry that we are in. Of course, in inventory is going to be a large asset type of account on the books. And we typically think of it as the lower of cost or market type of calculation. In other words, we have to put the inventory on the books. If we purchased it, we typically put it on there at cost. 
even though we're going to mark it up and sell it, of course. And then when we, when we make it, we're going to put it up in there in some kind of valuation on the, on the purchasing or, or the production process in terms of the valuation. But it's quite possible that if there's a lot of volatility in the market, that the value of that inventory can decline to possibly below what the cost is that we either we paid for it or produ produced it for. In that case, we as the auditors are concerned because we don't want to overvalue the inventory. Because remember, we were typically, we're typically on the, you know, conservative side in terms of valuation. We'd rather, in other words, possibly undervalue <laughs> than overvalue because that would normally be a safer position in terms of the auditing uh, type of process. So volatility is, is a problem for us or a type of inherent risk that we'll have to look into. Technology can also result in material misstatement as a result of obsolescence. So notice if you're in a type of industry that uses technology that needs to be updated a lot in order to kind of track this type of information, if the technology then becomes obsolete, if you're using uh, systems that become old, then that could be a problem as well in terms of valuation. Small products of high value are more uh, susceptible to theft. So notice if you obviously if your inventory is something like diamonds or something like that, then that's going to be more of a problem. If you're selling something like forklifts, it's kind of not likely that your inventory of forklifts are going to be someone's going to come in and steal the forklifts possibly. It can happen, but not nearly as likely if you sell diamonds. So if you have diamonds or something like that, then of course we would consider the diamonds to be more inherently light, uh, risky in that they're more subject to possible theft. And obviously the the company would be well aware of that inherent risk as well and probably have safeguards in place for that. Auditors should understand related party transactions related to acquiring raw materials and selling finished products. Whenever we consider inventory related party transactions, remember those transactions that are with people that are related or entities related such as subsidiaries to the company are suspect <laughs> transactions because we're, we're relating to someone that doesn't isn't a market factor. We don't have the same market forces. So if we have related party transactions, we need to look into them, see if they're material and see uh, whether or not they have been recorded properly or what the valuations are with regards to those transactions. Prior year misstatements are good indicators of potential misstatements in the current year. And so, of course, the standard audit practice of look at what happened last year and try to f use that to figure out what to do this year <laughs> applies to the inventory. If there's a problem last year, we're more uh, skeptical about the situation, of course, this year as well. That will increase then the inherent risk factors. So we have the inventory control risk. Now we're moving to control risk and recall that the control risk is going to be something that, of course, the auditor, knowing the inherent risks of the industry that they are in, puts in the controls into place in order to basically mitigate the type of inherent risks. We as the auditor want to also depend on the controls because we believe that the controls will mitigate the the ability of a, or the fact or the likelihood of a material misstatement so we want to see what controls are in place we have an understanding of the, the process an understanding of the company we've assessed what the inherent risks are then we want to think about the internal controls that have been put in place and whether or not we can rely on them so we want to understand and document the inventory management process based on a reliance strategy so what is the process of inventory we need to understand it and then we can plan and perform tests of controls on inventory transactions. So then we want to basically understand what, you know, the controls are within the organization. Then we think about how we can test for those controls. Our goal, of course, is to hopefully be able to test for controls. If it's a large company, we pretty much have to. If it's a small company, we may have less, less controls. We rely on them less. But we, we're hoping we can rely on the controls, test the controls, which will be less testing, than if we had to do all the testing and get all of our audit assurance, all of our evidence from the substantive testing. So we're gonna test the actual controls, the safeguards uh, within the organization. Then we're gonna set and document the control risk for the inventory management process. So then we could set what the control risk would be. Once we set the control risk, of course, we can then consider the detection risk. Once we have the inherent risk, the control risk, we consider the detection risk, the thing we have kind of control over, through the amount of testing we do typically with regards to substantive testing, the more detailed testing, going out to the client, you know, d doing things, pulling out inventory files, watching, looking at the inventory, observing and watching processes, those kind of things. So now we're going to look at the control activities and tests. We have the assertion of occurrence. So with regards to occurrence, we're going to observe and evaluate good segregation of duties. 
And as we go through these, remember, when we think about controls, we want to first think, you know, are these controls, do we have the controls set up? Do the controls look good in terms of what kind of controls are, are set up in plan, in theory, and then whether or not they've actually been implemented? Those are two completely different things. You can have good controls and then bad implementation of the controls because they can be take more time. So we want to go and make sure that, that there is actual occurrence of the controls as well. How? We can observe and evaluate good separation of duties. So segregation of duties is one of those things that can actually take more time, but can be a safeguard against problems that will be happening. So we want to make sure that we can observe to see that those are indeed in place. And then we can look at review and test procedures for transfer of inventory. We can review and test procedures for issuing materials to the manufacturing uh, department. So we're going to look at these controls. These type, these are the key components, the transaction components things are moving within the inventory system we want to test the controls relation to them review and test entity procedures related to a, a count number sequence of material requisitions so we have the material requisitions forms which should be have a pre-numbered or number sequence to them and then we're going to observe physical safeguards over the inventory then we have the assertion of completeness with regards to completeness review and test entities uh, procedures related to consignment goods so when we're thinking about completeness, uh, we're often thinking about the idea or the concept of consignment. Because you'll recall when we're thinking about inventory, we're often thinking that if the, if the entity is going to make an error on inventory or if they were to do something on purpose to misstate inventory, they'd probably overstate the inventory because that would make them look better if they overstated the inventory. But when we consider completeness, there could be an error with regards to completeness with regards to consignments because consignments can be kind of confusing. That would be basically... A, the people who physically have the inventory aren't actually the owners of the inventory. So one company would be providing the inventory to another, even though they still own the inventory. The other company then possibly facilitating a sale. And then once the inventory is sold, giving uh, some, some portion of that sale back to the original owner of the inventory. So with regards to completeness, we want to we want to consider the proper allocation of the inventory to the records. Then we have the authorization we're going to review authorized uh, production schedules. We want to basically review the authorization process, review and test procedures related to developing inventory levels and those used to control them. Then we have the assertion of accuracy. So we're considering the assertion of accuracy, review and test procedures related to taking physical inventory. So they should be taking a physical inventory. Of course, this is one of the major things with regards to audit that we'll kind of consider. Many of the new auditors will will go out and the company will actually do a physical inventory typically towards the end of the year and the auditors get to go out there and count you know the inventory and the physical inventory which is always a exciting time and then we have the review and test procedures to develop standard costs so we'll review and test the procedures that develop those standard costs so it's kind of like estimated costs and this would be in like a production type of process review and test variance reports so the, the difference between the standards and what actually happened again more of a, something that would happen if we're making the inventory, producing inventory, as opposed to purchasing and selling it. Review and test procedures for detecting obsolete, slow moving, and excess quantities. So we want to see the procedures for that because uh, if something's obviously obsolete or slow moving, or if we have excess quantities, it might well be the case that we're overvaluing the inventory given the fact that some of it is old. And note that within the audit process this could be a real problem for us because we as the auditor may not be experts in valuing inventory so when it comes to the question of well is this piece of inventory now below what the cost is should we write it down you, you know we don't really have the expertise to do that we might need experts to come in if we're valuing something like clothing or something like that or carpets or something like if it's old inventory how do we know how how uh what the value of the inventory has will be is it still valued correctly if it's been there for a long time we may may need some expert help in order to value some inventory that might be slow moving uh inventory review the reconciliation of perpetual inventory to the general ledger control control account so you'll recall the perpetual inventory system if we're talking about a publicly traded company they're probably recording the inventory as sales happen we want to be comparing the perpetual inventory system to the gl the general ledger, the controlling account. And then we have the cutoff, the assertion of the, the cutoff testing. And that's going to be the end of the year. You'll recall the end of the year type of, of information. What are the controls related to it to make sure things are recorded in the proper time period? Review 
review and test procedures related to processing inventory that is on receiving reports into the perpetual records. So again, the perpetual records, those records that we would be tracking on a perpetual basis with relation to inventory. So we want to consider then the receiving reports and then how they're going to relate to the perpetual records. Why? Because when should we be recording the inventory into the system? at that point in time that we have received it oftentimes. So with the receiving reports then often being the triggering point, and we wanna make sure that there's the proper controls over those. Again, you might think this sounds like something we did in the purchasing process. You're right, because there's gonna be overlap within the purchasing process and uh, the, inventory, the inventory process, because many of the things that we purchase quite possibly be one of the major things we purchase being of course inventory review and test procedures for removing inventory from the perpetual records because of shipment of goods so then of course the other side of things when we make sales we have the review of, of the perpetual inventories records going down because of the shipment so again we want to test the thing that should be triggering the inventory to be decreasing when should it be decreasing when we completed the work in accordance with revenue recognition when we no longer have ownership of the inventory when does that typically happen when with the shipping happens when the inventory leaves that's when we did the job and therefore that's what we want to tie out to the cutoff testing to make sure that the inventory going out lines up uh, in the proper time period and then we have the assertion of classification review uh, the procedures and forms for inventory classification next we have presentation review inventory reports general ledger and chart of accounts for pro proper aggregation and disaggregation we're going to review procedures and forms used to create inventory disclosures so how are they going to make those inventory disclosures and then we're going to review disclosure checklist and related disclosures for reliance on completeness so you'll note again that as we think about these controls some of them are butting up against some of the other controls we have tested as we consider other processes those being the purchasing process in particular as well as the sales process as part and, and possibly human resources and payroll to some degree as well so uh, as we consider these individually note they are interrelated in some degrees and we're going to be testing the controls of one in some to some degree to some component as we do the other we want to take that into consideration when we do the planning process now we're going to be considering inventory transactions looking first at the assertion of occurrence so the primary worry of the auditor is that every record recorded inventory transaction actually occurred so now we're thinking about the inventory transactions if the inventory transaction was recorded we're worried that it was that it actually happened that it, the actual occurrence happened that was recorded so the thing we're thinking about with occurrence is well what if they just made a transaction that didn't actually happen did it actually occur is there something behind the transaction that should have caused the transaction the auditor will also be worried that goods may be stolen it's another concern within occurrence the primary tests of controls then will be review and observation those are the primary tests of controls used to test the control for procedures now we're going to test inventory transactions with the assertion of completeness with regards to completeness the main control procedures relate to the, re the recording inventory that has been received so when we're considering completeness have we recorded the inventory that has been received because now we're considering of course with regards to completeness uh the in thing that we have that the in financial statements we can consider are they including all that they should be including with regards to inventory in other words are there inventory that's not being recorded in in terms of the transaction or isn't being a transaction that's not being processed within uh, the end procedure now this is going to be something that's going to be closely related to the purchasing process so something that we're probably going to be testing uh, within the purchasing process so you can basically review the procedures within the purchasing process with regards to the assertion of completeness and the receiving of the inventory and recording the receiving of the inventory then we have authorization of inventory transactions we're considering authorization with regards to inventory transaction primary worry here is the unauthorized purchase of product of production activity that may cause excess levels of certain types of finished goods the next assertion with regards to inventory transaction is accuracy inventory transactions not properly recorded can result in misstatements that directly affect the amounts reported on the financial statements so when we're considering the assertion of accuracy with regards to inventory it's really important of course because uh, the inventory in and of itself is generally something that's going to be material 
And if something is inaccurately reported, there's going to be a direct effect on the financial statements. And of course, we are here to give an opinion on the accuracy of the financial statements. Inventory purchases need to be recorded at the correct price and the actual quantity received. So we need to make sure that the inventory that's, that's going into the process is recorded one at the correct price and the correct quantity. Inventory shipped must be correctly recorded in cost of goods sold and the related revenue uh, recognized. So when we ship the inventory, recall, of course, that's the point in time that we would ship it out because we sold it. There's going to be two components to that when, when we have the sales process happening, right? The, the sale, we have the revenue component, revenue is going up, and then we have accounts receivable or cash uh, that would be going up as well. Then we have the inventory area that we're kind of thinking about here. Inventory, of course, would then be going down. Inventory would go down and revenue should be recognized. Typically at the, at the point in time when the work is completed when we, and on the expense side and the cost of goods sold when we have used the expense in order to help us to generate revenue, matching principal expense recognition, revenues recognized when we did the work in order to generate the revenue. Both those should be happening at the point in time when we ship the inventory, typically. Cost of goods sold, the expense being recorded, inventory going down at that point in time. Then we have the inventory transactions uh, assertion of cutoff, so the cutoff, end of the year cutoff. Inventory transactions that are recorded in the wrong period may affect many different accounts such as, or like, inventory, purchases, cost of goods sold. So it's quite possible that if the cutoff is wrong, if we have transactions at the end of the year that are, are being applied to the wrong place, then that's going to affect inventory, that's going to affect cost of goods sold, that could affect purchases, so that could have, have a, a, a substantial impact on, on the financials. And that's something that we're going to basically want to be considering as of the end of the year, looking at those types of transactions, considering and testing whether or not the transactions are being recorded in the proper time period also note if there was going to be something such as fraud or some kind of deception and it, like say someone wanted to look good if a manager for whatever reason wanted to pay, possibly get their bonus or something like that and they needed to increase sales or something then they they could do they could try to manipulate the numbers by adjusting the cutoff by by uh, taking sales possibly out of the next period and pulling them into this period so you want to be careful. We, we need to be careful with the cutoff and the reporting of cutoff because, of course, inventory can be significant. Those could be factors that could cause a significant impact on the financial statements. Then we have the assertion of classification. The entity needs to have control procedures to make sure inventory is classified correctly as either raw materials, working process, finished goods. Again, if, if they're not making the inventory, it's, it's more straightforward. Inventory is going to be the inventory if they're per, if they're producing the inventory making the inventory we have the added complexity of breaking out that inventory between the inventory accounts those of raw materials work in process finished goods we need to allocate through there through understanding which manufacturing department holds the inventory the auditor is able to classify it by type so we'll basically be able to know who's in who's holding it and that'll help us through that classification process in other words we need to know as the inventory flows through how it flows through the manufacturing process of course the manufacturing process is going to be more complex uh, for us to to be auditing inventory and then we need to get an understanding of you know where the inventory is at with regards to where it should be classified raw materials work in process or the finished product presentation of inventory so within the presentation assertion tests of controls regarding management's use of a chart of accounts proper codes for recording inventory transactions and the financial reporting process, including the use of a disclosure checklist. Controls over the aggregation or disaggregation of transactions are needed to properly allocate costs to the correct classes of inventory.